So we're going to try something new right now. Uh, rather than do a lecture in class, um, for the first time I'm trying a screencast lecture, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, if we like it, we'll use it as a way to replace lecture. Um, if not, we can do stuff in the classroom. So just a few ground rules to get us started here. Uh, as you're watching, it's important that you listen carefully to the lecture. So make sure you're turning off any of those distractions you might have. Secondly, this is designed to give you a chance to fill in the notes and listen to me explain things a little bit. So you need to have your notes out. Um, as we go through, you should see that the important words are already underlined, so there's nothing you should miss. Last but not least, I think one thing that might help is writing notes in the margin, especially things that are significant that uh, maybe aren't in the actual notes in the slides. So tonight's lecture, today's lecture, is about feudal Europe, but we really can't learn about feudal Europe without going first back to the time period of the fall of Rome. The Roman Empire at one point experienced its own golden age, similar to what we saw in the Islamic caliphates and in China. During Rome's golden age, it was at the height of art, architecture, philosophy, science, medicine. As a matter of fact, a lot of the knowledge that we associate with uh, the Islamic caliphates, stuff that was improved there and in China, actually starts in Rome here and moves across to the rest of the world. But what we're really looking at here on the map then is the decline of the Roman Empire. So at one point, all of this area in white was controlled by Rome from Britain all the way down to the Middle East. But over time, corruption of the government, the transformation of Rome from a representative republic to an empire, plus, as you can see on the map, um, one invasion after another is gonna to lead to the fall of Rome in 476. After Rome falls, we really don't see the recreation of another strong, united empire in Europe uh, for a very long time. The Eastern Roman Empire still stays in existence. Its capital, of course, is in Constantinople, but uh, we're gonna talk about that at a later point. If you look at the map, it might look kind of confusing, and that's because it really is. Uh, after Rome collapses, Europe divides up into a lot of smaller territories. Um, we will see a little bit of unity here in France, um, but for the most part, it's divided up into these little feudal territories. So today we're going to focus on feudal Britain first, or feudal England, and then we'll go to France later in another video. So let's talk a little about England. Um, first of all, after the fall of Rome, England was controlled by a group of people who were a Germanic tribe that traveled over in the 5th and 6th centuries. These people were called the Anglo-Saxons. England did experience a lot of invasions, especially during the 9th century. Uh, caused by the Danish Vikings. But the Vikings weren't really people who would come and conquer a territory. Sometimes they would settle, but for the most part, they just traveled up and down the coast, targeting specifically monasteries, places that had a lot of riches, but were easy targets. The person who does conquer England was aptly named William the Conqueror, and he took over in 1066. Now, William is actually French, technically. He's from Normandy, which Incidentally, is also the place in 1944 that the Allied troops landed on um, in World War II. But at this time, uh, it's a small French kingdom that sends knights over under, your, under William and is going to defeat the Anglo-Saxon king, um, whose name is Harold at the Battle of Hastings. So in 1066, uh, the Anglo-Saxons fall to the Normans. The Normans come in as this invading force, and they set up, as you see down here at the bottom, a feudal nation. In England. The pictures you're looking at are actually from a really famous tapestry called the Bayou Tapestry. Um, it's an incredible piece of art, but you can also see that it's not really reflective of a golden age in art and architecture. Later, when we look at the Renaissance, we're going to look back at this picture and kind of laugh at the two-dimensional nature of it. The fact that this soldier here is much taller than the horse and is sort of behind and in front at the same time. So the fact that this image looks like it could have been done by a fourth grade sibling of yours shows that these are not really civilizations in Europe that are in the midst of the Golden Age. So once William takes over England, 
he's going to set up essentially a feudal state there. The first thing he's going to do is publish the Doomsday Book, which uh, comes out in 1086. It essentially records land ownership, but very, very shortly afterwards, William is going to uh, rearrange that land ownership. And what he does is he divides up the territory among approximately 200 of his fellow Norman knights, Norman lords. They get the land in exchange for loyalty. And this is essentially how feudalism works. So if you think about society in terms of a pyramid here, William is at the top. He's the king and he's in control of all of England. But he doesn't have quite as much power as an emperor that we might be familiar with from China. So, for example, William is king, but he relies on the nobles to do things like provide troops or soldiers for his army. He also relies on them to provide taxes. So really, without the nobles, William is powerless. This is what we see at the beginning of a centralized feudal system in England. Later, under Henry II, um, a lot more French territory is going to be added to the English crown. Henry also had judges head into the countryside to collect taxes and settle lawsuits and punish crimes. So Henry began to centralize England a lot more than William and take a little bit of that power away from uh, the nobles themselves. Now, the nobles were hereditary rulers. They got power from their dad, just like the king had. And that's going to factor into this, this next slide. One of the things that we see, though, that comes out in, in Henry II's time that's pretty important for the history of England is a system of common laws. Beforehand, under William, lords were basically able to do whatever they wanted in their territory. But now there's a common system of laws that was established throughout England. Just like there's patterns of centralization, though, there's also patterns of decentralization in England. And that all starts with one of Henry II's sons, John. He's the successor of his older brother, Richard the Lionheart, who is famous from some of the Crusades. John's basically a villain in history, uh, so much so that he's featured as the villain in whatever variation of Robin Hood you've ever seen. Right? King John is usually the bad guy. Basically, what he does is he's just not a very good king. He's not a nice guy either. Um, John lost control of a lot of territory, and his failed military campaigns essentially make him raise taxes. Um, this sharp raise in taxes is going to anger the nobles, who, when they fought back, are going to be threatened by John. Uh, John threatens that he's going to take control of them. One of the tricks he's going to use during this time period is throwing nobles who refuse to collect taxes for him in jail and never giving them a trial. Well, in the end, his cruel policies and the sharp raise in taxes causes the nobles to take action. Basically, the situation in a feudal system allows the nobles, if they can bind their power and refuse to provide troops to the king, to almost have more power than the king himself. And the nobles use this leverage to get King John to sign a document called the Magna Carta, which is Latin for Great Charter, a great document. This is a foundational document that's super important, not just in British history, but also in our history too. So Magna Carta is the first document. We kind of have this idea of no taxation without representation. The idea that the king cannot raise taxes without the permission of the nobles. It also does some other things like guarantee habeas corpus. You couldn't be thrown in jail anymore without a trial. And when you did get that trial, there was going to be a trial by jury. Finally, it solidifies the nobles' position in society and protected their rights to owning land so that King John or any other king couldn't take that right away from them. A later successor of John, Edward I, is going to establish then the first parliament. This is the first form of representative government in Europe after the collapse of the Roman Empire. It's eventually going to take over as the leader of England, but that's not for another several centuries. At this time, its main role is going to be nobles, because they're the only ones who really have representation, getting together to advise the king on taxation. We're going to talk later about this uh, 1400 parliament meeting to that point, but for now, we're going to take a break, and uh, I'll pick up again with feudalism in France. Thanks for listening.